sandwiches, buns or splits. Cider. Eggs, barrel of cider. Goat's milk. We'd always be sandwiches and... Cider. Butter and jam. It used to be sandwiches. And buns. Cakes. Sandwiches. And drinks, basically. Plain bread. Cream. Harvest tea. We brought cider into the field. Living off the land, 100 years of farming in South Devon. Episode 2, Harvest Tea. Stories of fresh food and drink. Good memories, really. It's a, it was a, a bit of a get together of the community, the people, the working people. You all came, came here together, and you get six or seven or seven or eight harvest thing, and the, you know, the chat would be different. And, but the main thing was to get in, end up in the, the cellar over a glass of cider afterwards. You see, in those days, we used to when it was a fairly when you were doing a lot of handwork in the fields, you brought cider into the fields. That was one of the attractions. Uh, but as we became mechanised, I had to stop the cider coming into the field because people had got a bit irresponsible if they had too much cider. And then we used to uh, they'd gather in the cellar after you'd finished work and you know, go down there and, and uh, Margaret or my mother would provide some scones and that sort of thing. And then you'd have a half an hour to, to an hour celebration afterwards, which was, well, Part of the attraction of them coming, I feel sure. We used to make cider here, yes. We used to have a pound house here, and the, they used to pound the, the apples here, I suppose they used to make in those days. It would be probably two or three hundred gallons of cider. And we used to do that when we were at Trenwell Farm as well. We didn't have a pound house at Trenwell Farm, but there used to be one in the village of South Milton. And. Uh, I was telling the South Milton Historic Society one of the things I used to enjoy when I came out of the primary school when I was about 10 or 11 in September, October time. We used to come out of the primary school in the school and walk over the road into the pound house and we were allowed to have one horn of cider. It wasn't cider, of course, it was just apple juice. And we ate out of the cow's horn all our way home from school. <laughs> So I suppose you could say that got us into drinking habits in our younger days. And you know, the, the horsemen in particular, that was part of their wages to have cider. You know, they used to work seven days a week, the horsemen in those days. They'd come obviously in the morning to feed the horses and then they'd have their cider and then they'd have cider lunchtime and they'd have cider when they went home. And on Sunday when they came in, they never used to get paid for Sunday work, but they were allowed to take cider home for their Sunday lunch. That was part of their um, part of their pay, as I said. We used to one chap in particular. He wasn't a horseman, but he was what they called a a rabbit and rat catcher. But he was also a general farm worker, and he used to go around helping all the farmers in the neighbourhood. And he had quite a quench for cider. He would come in the morning, first thing, and he could drink a quart of cider, four pints of cider, first thing in the morning. He'd take out another quart with him and drink during the morning. Come in lunchtime, he'd have another quart. In the afternoon, he'd take out a quart, drink during the afternoon, then he'd take home a quart with him at night. Every day, when if he was working on our farm. And when we were harvesting in, in the summertime, when we were picking up the sheaves of corn in the field, there was nobody that could throw sheaves up of corn like he did, all day long, non-stop. But he, he was kept liquefied, if you like, with his cider, but he was an amazing chap to work. Amazing chap. I mean, every farm, it's just part of the purpose of the orchard in those days was to produce the cider um, to have for entertainment, wasn't it? I mean, we made quite a bit of cider. Not on the farm, it was made down at Lee Mill. There was a pound down there. 
I remember going down to the old fashioned pine where they set the apples up on the straw and uh, squeezed it down to get the juice out. But in, I don't know what you can say about it really. It was basic, it worked, um, you wouldn't be able wouldn't be unheard of the old vermin they're running about in it, but it happened and uh, hygiene was out of the window really. All the apples that were collected and taken there to make cider, and we had to cider, cider back. In 1953, this was changed September 1953, when the asbestos roof was put on and the thatch was done away with. As you can see, a lot of these walls are cobbles. And so they were getting wet, and it was still owned by then the landlord, which was South Irish Estates. And him and his builders decided that they'd do away with quite a bit of the cob and put up a new block, which obviously faces the front garden of the farmhouse. As you can see, that the inside building where the cider used to be kept. We've now come into the shed, which is where the cider used to be stored. That used to be a thatch roof as well, and uh, obviously now that's all asbestos. You can see how much below ground level it is. You know, all the walls are obviously still green, but there's still all the cob walls. Cob walls are very good, providing you keep them dry at all times. I understand that we stopped making cider when the water wheel with the cider press used to actually work electricity before the war, the Second World War that is, and uh, during the war it was all hands that were left here on the land to be on the land, and I think the cider, the, the, uh, the leet got... Um, the leak used to need a lot of labour to keep it going, and I understand that that's when the water wheel was stopped. Um, I mean, there were fairly strict rules with these orchards. You weren't supposed to stock them with anything but small animals, and they were not larger animals, because they damaged the trees. And if a tree died, you had to replace it. Well, it got to the stage when you're, there was no purpose in replacing it because there was no, no use for the, the apples produced from it. I suppose, and then, well, that's why they were all taken out, brought back into growing useful crops. I mean, that was a useful crop in its time and still is. I mean, there's apples growing all over the world now, isn't there? Well grown, and um, that was done on a more local scale in those days. I mean, if you go into the Totnes area, there, you'll find there's more apples now, uh, apple trees, than there, there were in our area. But, well, I said there's about nearly five acres on Strassley, which was quite a size of acreage. The other thing is there was a, a lot of the apples were gathered and, and stored in the house uh, for for domestic use. Like, I mean a lot of cooking was apples and there was, there was only sort of winter fruit you had wasn't it? There was apples. I mean I remember gathering these apples you'd go down with a horse and wagon and gather loads of them and take them up and store them in the house. I can remember that we used to have a barrel of cider um, when I was very young, there used to be over barrels and a gentleman who had a couple of barrels of cider. And I can remember as a child, when harvest was on, he'd, he'd stop you in the road and he'd say, do you want a drink of cider? Um, and I remember that now. He used to have two or three barrels of cider. He was an old-fashioned sort of gentleman. Selling to the public. Initially, when my father started farming here, he had cows, he had one or two sheep, he had pigs, 
and their main enterprise was chickens, hens, laying hens, because they were very profitable in those days. They used to keep two to three hundred hens in the deep litter sheds, and, and, and my mother used to um, do all the eggs, and that enterprise ceased in about 1970s. The eggs were sold to a firm called Tompkins, who uh, were for Lottiswell. Um, and, then, and after that, they were sent to an egg, uh, sold to an egg co-op, which I, I can't recollect the name, where, where you sold it to a co-op and, and, and you built up a, a share in the co-op. But unfortunately, the co-op went bust, and so we lost the money we built up. But the most interesting thing, we used to have an egg machine, didn't we? Oh, yes. You yeah. Remember the egg machine? <laughs> Yes, we, we did at one point have an egg vending machine out on the edge of the village, yeah. which, which we stuff. used to sell our eggs in. And, and, and at the end, my father used to deliver eggs to various shops and places in Dartmouth um, until they, they, they finished with the hens. It was one of those enterprises which, when mother and father started, were very, very profitable. The egg machine was always very interesting when we were kids because it was defunct by then. But it used to sit right at the top of the village by Start Bay Park, did not it? On a concrete stand in, and people used to come up and put money, obviously, in it, like a cigarette machine, <laughs> and put the money in and take the eggs out. And it used to amaze me, actually. <laughs> it was some of the just, yeah, it was a proper automated uh, egg machine. I always remember it for some reason. It was never working in my time, but. That's how I met my husband. I married the milkman. I was a student, a very mature student in those days. We didn't marry until the 30. I mean, he sold green top milk um, all around the village. Yeah. Yeah, they did. Uh, but that's all finished, of course. Now, that finished, actually, that was all to do with paying something or other. It didn't make sense in the end, anyway. They made it um, difficult to do. Mm. Mm. I think eggs have always been sold by everybody. Yes, yeah. You've got to about there. 400 hens now, haven't you? You can yeah. see them down there, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. They're all outside. So the eggs, the tradition of, sort of selling eggs is carrying on from the sort of family Yeah, that's always, always happened, is not it? Well, I can always remember it from when I was I think we had a dozen when I was young, and now right. about 400 or something, aren't they? Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. But it's very, um, you can see those sheds, can't you? They're yeah. all very... Yeah, just locally we have people that come to the farm to collect them, and um, we, we have a couple of delivery rounds a week. And then a um, couple of local pubs and... Uh, tea rooms and an old people's home. Um, so yeah, all very, very local. Yeah. Because there are different rules that apply if you sell them through a shop, aren't there? Which are very annoying rules. You have to weigh every egg. Well, weigh, you have to grade them and stamp them or something, don't you? But if you You're sell them direct, you can sell them. Do what you do now, yeah. Stamped, yeah. Yeah. The boot of my car is still um, approved by Environmental Health or something very weird that happens. Is it? Our youngest son was allergic to cow's milk. If he hadn't had started goats, he would never have survived, I don't think. And so it increased. I started with two, and I ended up with 16, 17. And they were milked by machine up the top up there. And they were never tied up, never shut in. And the goat train used to go off after milking up across the fields, we called it, one after the other. And they'd be gone all day. We knew at five o'clock they would, the goat train would come home. You see them all coming one behind the other, coming back down ready for milking. Um, they knew the time, didn't they? Mm. And there again, that was a good thing for visitors. They used to love to go up and try to milk the goats, didn't they? And, mm. and take part in all that. Well, you used to sell the milk, didn't you? Frozen, because goats milk you can freeze. Mm. So it used to be sales in packs, and we used to have quite a people come out for asthma and eczema cases. Yes, we did. You'd, you know, tell them 10 pints of frozen goats milk for the week. That's right. And... Uh, and off they went like that. But then Kieran, my youngest brother, so he's allergic, so he spent, we probably having 15 years, didn't we? Yes, yes. The milk went to Plymouth. Yeah, that was interesting, really. We always produced milk and sent it to Plymouth. <coughs> the method of selling it in Plymouth, you went in Plymouth and went around and found a shop that would buy your milk. And you'd sell it to them for a month. And uh, they... Um, when you went in at the end of the month, there was a risk that they'd shut shop and gone. And this was a sort of flexibility of it. Not always, but that's what happened. You had to get the milk to Plymouth by a seven o'clock or a bit before mornings. Uh, I remember when I was taking in there in churns, 
but I don't can't remember. Some people took their own in the back of the car and this sort of thing, presumably horses and traps and that sort of thing. I don't remember that exactly. But then, then my father, I remember, went to Plymouth and found a, a reliable shop in there. They would pay him uh, for his milk, and they'd give him, he'd pay a penny premium to have the same amount of milk, penny a gallon premium, to have the same amount of milk every day of the year. Which uh, you may think, uh, that's funny, but if you know anything about dairy, the, the dairy cow will give a lot more milk in the spring of the year when there's grass, and not in the autumn. <clears throat> so the consequence was that um, he wanted to, to have a, what he called a level delivery. So we agreed to do that. And my father uh, he did his best to do it. And then uh, if you were a bit, in the autumn, when milk was a bit scarce, you'd buy a new calf cow from Ivybridge Market uh, to keep your, your amount of milk up, your level delivery. Well, traditionally, obviously, prior to 1994, all milk was sold through the milk marketing board. Um, we actually stayed in the same regime because we um, stayed with Milk Mark, which was a cooperative born from Milk Marketing Board. Um, we then that was split up in 1999, and we then joined Milk Link, which was a regional cooperative um, based mostly in the southwest. And then last year, we've actually amalgamated with Arla. So now, technically, we're the largest co-op in Northern Europe. So we've gone from being British-owned, co- well, cooperative, which MMB was, right through now, to be European-owned as such. So there's this change, still run regionally, obviously, but so I suppose that's changed a lot. We owe a great debt to my brother Roger, who drove away the, the lorry in about 1968, Ish, and we went and we took the cauliflowers away to Oxford and to Fife's group and we owe a great debt to Fife's, the banana people, for buying and selling our produce. Before I came here with my brothers I would be going to Bournemouth and Southampton twice a week, sometimes, sometimes three times, but I got booked that time uh, delivering cauliflowers and vegetables. The cauliflower has actually been the king pin to our family's success. That all went fine until the supermarkets came along and uh, that was the end of our cauliflower production because they treated us too rough, too hard, didn't want to pay enough money. The milk was being cooled over a surface cooler. So I used to go into a D-pan on the top come down very slowly over the surface cooler, the water was going through the inside of the surface cooler. So if were you were using your own water supply, which most farmers did, that supply was never that strong. So we obviously had to regulate the flow of milk in order to make sure it was cool when it went into the churns. Because if it wasn't, when they picked up the churns the following day, if one of those churns was gone off, you had it back again. And when we actually, before we went to bulk collection, or I think our final amount of churns was like 42 churns on the milk stand. <laughs> so it was quite a significant amount. So that's 42 a day? Yeah. Mother used to take great pride in her cream. And uh, Saturdays, the customers would put out their cream dishes with what amount of cream they wanted in two ounces, four ounces, six ounces. Ooh, they'd sometimes have a half a pound. They'd put out their dishes and some would be quite lovely. Some would be on a stem, if you please. We'd always take a great big market basket. And Mother would issue us with some, you know, some clean bags, clean grease proof bags. And when you had, when you picked up the dish from the customer, you'd write on the piece of paper who it was and the amount they wanted and put the... Um, dish in that bag and then the bag would go in the big basket and by the time we finished we'd have a pile you know we had a little boy or young man that used to or a little boy I suppose used to help on the milk ground he'd come with running glass dish in each hand that's Mrs somebody's and that's Mrs somebody's and you had to get it quite right and put the amount they wanted and then mother used to get out four o'clock Sunday mornings because she used to take it up fresh Sunday mornings and put it in the dishes put it back in the bag again and then we made a big tray 
that used to fit on the back seat of the car, you know, a shallow tray, because you didn't want it deep, deep. And um, they were all put out in order where we wanted them to take them. And you'd do it for six months a quarter. You know, but see what work when you did that, didn't it? Harvest tea. In the evening, I'd come home from school, and I'd probably be only five years old, and it, it was great to have harvest tea in the, uh, in the field. My mother used to bring the harvest tea, which obviously used to consist of sandwiches and usually apple pasties and cream, which obviously were all homemade by her. And, uh, and the ladies always had to take out tea. And that was a major operation. You'd start off after dinner. Mother used to bring out, and there's the old copper kettle she brought the tea out in. She used to bring out the refreshments. and to, So that we'd add our refreshments by the time they came, so that all hands could start work at five o'clock to carry on with the harvesting. You have a great big market basket. you put a great big clean cloth in the bottom, and you'd make sandwiches. And in the morning, you'd probably made a lot of buns or splits or something, what you had. There would always be sandwiches and butter and jam, cake and buns. Nothing very elaborate. You know, you wouldn't take out a Victoria sponge. But it was wholesome, wholesome, but not very sweet. And you'd take out a big harvest kettle. And, um, well, in those days, there weren't such things as tea bags. But you'd have a clean piece of muslin and you'd tie your tea leaves in that, or tea in that. And then you'd put it in these big harvest kettles of boiling water, and then the ladies would carry it out. I've carried, you know, carried out. I've done the milking first, and then I've carried out the teas. But it was quite enjoyable. Good memories, really. It's a, it was a, a bit of a get-together of the community. The people, the working people, they all came, came out together, and you'd get six or seven or seven or eight harvesting, and the, you know, the chat would be different. And you brought out so men that had been working in a quarry were were working as a group of men, and they had a lot more chat to bring to us because we were isolated out on the farm. And I think that was so that's been part of my relax re, reflections on my life. Really, was a bit of isolation, and uh, I don't say you didn't learn anything, but it was all within your own field of op- for opportunities. That's something that's lost now because. They can never stop, and there aren't so many. No, because, I mean, the person that comes in to bail it today, he doesn't want to stop, because oh, unless you've got a bailer of loan, you do it, and you can't stop anyway. But if you have a bailer in, I mean, he can't stop, he got to go on to somewhere else, and not he, as a rule. The cows, of course, were South Devon cows, which were higher in, uh, in butter fat. Their milk was higher in butter fat, but obviously less in yield. And um, while they were high in butter fat, and there weren't the... Uh, worry about having high cholesterol etc probably because everybody worked so hard they worked it well, they worked it all off anyway the cream was taken off the top of the milk with a, a separator which is a little machine which you used to turn by hand and i remember doing it when i was strong enough to do it probably six or seven years old and uh, you turn the milk into a thick milk and then that would be um, put on a simmering pan on the the aga which um, my mum had a Solid fuel agar, and then in later years, had a, a it was became a um, a burning oil agar, which you've still got now. But the uh, cream, to make that that cream is beautiful. And when I was young, of course, when you're young, it's good bone building to have um, milk products and uh, cream on bread with syrup. We called thunder and lightning. And that's wonderful to eat to give you some energy. All oh, the men that used to work for us used to love the apple pasties. We'd sit, sit down at about five o'clock and then enjoy the, the harvest tea and then we'd start work again then and work until it was dark, really. It would be a little tea party <laughs> in the funniest sort of way, really. You see, the poor men were glad of a break. You know, you think working in the heat of the day from midday on with hay, you are doing it all by hand. Um, it's not easy. 
Yeah, I remember. I remember making hay. You didn't stop and go into the house. You had to have the tea in the field, so you stopped for just five minutes with the a great big kettle of tea with a potato over the spout to stop the spillage and to keep it keep the the heat in and uh, jam sandwiches great for the energy years ago when we were kids we didn't have electricity we didn't have fridges but we lived on plain food my wife Vicky her dad grampy Irish he lived with us and he was 101 when he died but he just loved a slice of bread and butter, but he, you know, he just liked bread and butter. If he was having a, if you were having a fruit salad for afters or whatever it was, he'd have to have a slice of bread and butter with his fruit salad. He just liked plain bread. That was when we had harvest tea out in the field that looks over the cliffs called Emmet. Well, um, it used to be sandwiches, um, and used to have meat, not just jam sandwiches, cake, either a fruit cake or fruit buns. Uh, a great big kettle with hot water and make the tea or coffee. But normally in those days, it used the tea used to come out and come out and already made the, the liquid tea. And by the time we got it out in the field, it could be a little bit on the stewed side. But I mean, um, yeah, cakes, sandwiches, and drinks basically. It was a different way of life then. I mean, harvest yes was busy, but there was a lot more people. It was, a, it was a, a steadier way of life. It wasn't the rush and the tear where we're now. You're sat in, the, uh, in a very plush cab in the tractor, air conditioning, radio, mobile phone, flask and bag in the tractor. And I've seen, as, as Diane seen many times, and actually driving along and eating and drinking at the same time because we're in such a rush and a tear. We had more time then, we got now, without doubt, um, because you relied on, on, on people. And when you work long hours harvesting, tea like that was um, always well accepted. And you just finish your harvest tea and some of the locals from Kingsbridge, of course being only just under a mile away, I can uh, visualise now in one of the fields that's near Kingsbridge, we would be getting near the middle of the field and the rabbits have been working their way to the middle of the field out the way of the binder because the binder always went around, 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 not, not to and fro, but around, around, around the field. And we get to the middle and the eventually the rabbits had to do something and they, they'd make a bolt for the hedge. Well, of course, the hedge was a long way away. And the locals would be coming out and they their help in the field to stitch the sheaves, their reward was to be able to chase these rabbits and see if they could catch some. That's a good memory, that. In Harvest Tea, we heard from Harry Kurzweil, Jill Kurzweil, David Dark, Phil Dark, David Wall, Mark Wall, Richard Foss, John Sherrill, Jean Sherrill, Roger Tucker, John Tucker, Bill Salter and Marjorie Buckpitt. Living Off the Land was produced by Lucinda Guy for Sound Art Radio in partnership with South Devon Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty and was supported by the Heritage Lottery Fund as part of All Our Stories.